trans voices and transformation. This week on the show, using independent media to make connections. I interview Imara Jones in a conversation about her two shows, Trans Representation and Resistance in the Age of Trump. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. But the pop culture moment of the week came when the chief knowledge officer of CrossFit, Russell Berger, wrote in a tweet, don't these people know Twitter is dangerous by now? That LGBTQIA pride is, quote, a sin, close quote, showing indeed that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Now, apparently Berger knew that it was Pride Month, and he knew that CrossFit in Indianapolis, in another head-scratching moment, had chosen to cancel a Pride event. But what he did know is that for many gay people, CrossFit is like church, with shouting, testifying, and running in the aisles. And perhaps as important from a corporate perspective, is that CrossFitters are wealthy, earning on average $150,000 a year. Well, whatever he forgot, the company's CEO told him to shut the quote F up, close quote, and to hide out for real, he said both of those things, which became easy to do because, well, Berger was fired. All this goes to show you that you never get in between a chief executive and his money. That was a clip from The Last Sip with Amara Jones. The Last Sip is a weekly show that premiered on Free Speech TV earlier this year. It features discussions on politics, culture, and the hot topics of the day. And as its audience, it targets historically marginalized communities and brings those voices to the fore on subjects such as diversity in technology, trans rights, or one of the hottest shows of the summer, Pose. On top of that, Amara Jones has another show out now, a web docuseries that we'll also be hearing more about. Imara, thanks for joining us. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I was trying Good to remember when here. was the first time we met or were on a show together. I couldn't actually remember, but I feel like we've crossed paths for a long time. Indeed. And like, I mean, I mean, most recently, and then conferences as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And now we're both on Free Speech TV. There you go. Among other places. So tell us a little bit about The Last Sip. What are you sipping for a start? We are sipping information from the front lines of social change. We believe that... Um, the communities that are, as you say, the most historically marginalized are actually where the solutions to our most pressing problems are coming from, because they're the people that are most invested in finding solutions, right? The people that are most impacted are the most invested in finding new solutions. But many, in many ways, those are the voices that, as you know, are not uplifted or not brought forward in media, and particularly those that are at the intersection of race, class, um, also gender, as well as sexual orientation and identity, that all of those things sort of create new points of view for us to look at and think about in our, our society. And as we become more diverse, it is even more the case. Yeah, I always say the people with the front line seat on what is happening are the ones who can bring us the news. That's right. You know, people who are at the cutting edge are, are getting cut, but they're also getting smart That's exactly about right. what's happening. So give us some examples of some of the people you've had on, some of the shows you're excited about. I, one of the shows that I think stands out for me the most is when we had an, almost an entire show that was dedicated to sexual assault amongst um, African-American women and girls. And we spoke about it from a hist historical uh, point of view. We spoke about it from a contemporary culture point of view. There was one person that we had on who believes, um, Trevor Lindsay, uh, a professor, who wrote an entire article for Vox about how black women's activism actually helped to set up the prosecution of Bill Cosby. So we had her on, and that was an, a very interesting. And then also Aisha Shahida Simmons, who is a well-known um, restorative justice voice in terms of sexual assault. And it was the first time that I had ever seen a program on television, on news, devoted to that subject, and where everyone speaking about it were all African-American women. And the conversation was broad, bringing into that not only cis women, but also trans women, and a larger discussion about the role of, of men of all backgrounds mm -hmm. in that. And so um, that was a program that stands out for me. There are other segments um, that stand out for me. One of them, as you mentioned, was um, one that we did on the way in which an African-American woman-led VR team 
here in New York is using VR technology as a way to combat the uh, impact of racism by embedding women um, in an all African-American environment to help uh, counteract the impact of PTSD and other things mm -hmm. that are caused by racism, mm -hmm. which was a total innovative um, point of view. So those are some of the standouts for me. Yeah, and you're doing this new docu-series now, yeah. Translash, great yeah. title. What do we see in Translash? One of the things that interests me about, Transla what about Translash um, and about this particular moment is that um, we're at a moment of social backlash. Um, which is undeniable in almost every single way. But at the same time, um, there's been a dramatic expansion of the number of people who are transitioning, even in the last two years. Wow, is that documented? Is mm -hmm. that oh. mm -hmm. Not just we don't, we're not just that we're knowing more people, it's that it's happening more. It's happening, it's happening more. The number of patients at various LGBTQ clinics. So for instance, at Cowan Lord here in New York, um, the single largest, fastest category of patients they have are trans patients. And it's increased the overall number of patients they have by 25%. Which is not to say that it's suddenly gotten easier <laughs> or more comfortable to be a trans person in America. No. And so one of the things that my own process of transitioning sparked in me was what's this link between a backlash and leaning forward, right? And what does that say about the moment that we're in? And I have to say that Donald Trump's election was a spur in me to accelerate my process, uh -huh. I have to say. And I found in talking to other people that I'm not alone in that. And so one of the things that I think is happening is one of the core rationales, I believe, from the right is that they want to take the country back to a time when essentially they were dominant, right? right? Um, and, and felt the most comfortable, even though objectively the country wasn't better off, but they felt that, right? right? Um, and the idea is that if they undermine the pillars of support for all of the people that have been able to come to the fore since 1965, particularly, they are very, very focused on 1965, because um, that's the year of immigration change and also um, the Voting Rights Act, it was after the Civil Rights Act. They're very focused on that. Um, that um, that somehow that the country will become wider, more male, more patriarchal, and more Christian and more stable um, from their point of view. Um, but one of the things I think that is indic indicative of where we might be going is this, this moment, this tension that I mentioned, where actually, honestly, as they continue to push back and try to turn the clock back, that actually more people who they want to go away are, are going to rise up even more. More is even like as an act of resistance. That's exactly right. And so what they're actually doing is not setting the country on a more stable path from their point of view. They're actually putting the country on a more unstable path. That what we're doing is setting up, we're setting up clashes. Yeah. We're not actually going to end them. Um, and that's interesting. And I want to talk to people about why they decided to transition now. Um, we're going to be speaking to um, leaders of various organizations, uh, cast members from Pose, and there's also another um, hot show that, fo that focuses on trans people called um, My House on Viceland, uh, those cast members, and then also some aspects of my own medical transition this summer. So there's a lot to pack in in those episodes, but it's that essential tension of the pushback and the pushback, yeah. and where that leads us. And, and then I want to talk to you about media, because I, I was struck this summer to see, you know, on the front page of the New York Times at some point, a fairly, you know, fairly positive story about transmigration and, and the challenges mm -hmm. that trans people have mm -hmm. at the border. And I thought to myself, well, that story wouldn't have appeared. I mean, I can't imagine it ever appearing before now. Um, I'm sure there's problems with the reporting, but there is more reporting and it's not all terrible. With respect to the media, what do you think's changing? Are we, is there, are you seeing positive change? Or just greater number of stories, what? Well, I think that there is there is this, as trans becomes more visible, there's more coverage. Right. Right, and, it, and, it, and it, it rises in people's consciousness, which is what happens in moments like this. Um, I think that with more coverage, some of the coverage is gonna be good right. and some of the coverage is gonna be bad, but there actually is just more of it, right? Um, and I think that the people who do write about trans issues do care about it, right? It doesn't seem like editors are assigning them to people that don't care. Oh, go just cover the story. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, there's that what's happening in mainstream sources and sort of mainstream center, left of center. So, for instance, The Atlantic has a huge um, devoted uh, on trans issues. So there's a lot of 
focus on that. But are trans people writing and trans people talking? No, 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 no. So there are a couple of issues. Not only are trans people not writing and talking, which is part of the rationale for my show, but it's also the case that um, there's also this huge underground, equally negative, equally disgusting churn in right-wing media that's anti-trans. Um, and that is, um, there's, so I was recently at um, a conference of the NEA uh, that focused on social justice. And one of the things that I heard over and over, the not only, Association. yeah, yeah, National Education Association, not only on trans issues, but in general, there's this emerging conversation on the right that um, ethnic studies, quote, transgenderism is the, the, what they call it, is a conspiracy that's being put forth by Jews in the media to undermine white Christian America. Mm, and I heard it. Agenda kind of thing. Right. But I heard it from several different places. I only did, I heard it in a Black Lives Matter conference. I heard it in a transgender conversation. So there's also this equal churn. And that dark media, as we saw from the last election, has just as much impact as what's happening in the broader press. So I think that there's a countervalence even as things continue to improve with the deficiencies that you spoke about. So talk about your journey a little bit, not just the mm -hmm. transition, but your transition from working in the Clinton administration, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. inside a belly of a beast, yes. to this kind of independent, I think very brave um, production making, in making media yourself, making your own voice heard. Yeah. Um, well, you have to have a touch of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, Absolutely. as you know, um, it's not an easy path. Um, I think that... Because you, you were in the communications office. Uh, no, I actually, I worked on trade. Oh, you did? I worked on trade and communications. Oh, there you go. Um, in the last two years of the administration. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that I've always held in myself is that I believe that we have a responsibility to make things better. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that we then have to ask ourselves objectively what makes things better. Yeah. And the more experience you get, the more you learn what makes things better. And I think that's essentially been on my journey. That's been what my, been my journey is that essentially, because one of the things is I'm, I was trained as an economist. You know, I went to the London School of Economics. That's where my degree is from. There are certain things that you're trained as an economist that are just orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, economic growth is going to benefit the most number of people. It's lifted the most number of people out of poverty, et cetera. And you, we are trained in orthodoxy, that's right. quite frankly, um, without question. And I think that one of the things that living does and life does and experience and seeing the world is that you get to test those early ideas against the actual realities. And I think that there are some severe deficiencies in the way that our society works. And that if you actually want society to work better for people, we have to have radical change. So I'm gonna ask you to do something maybe makes you uncomfortable, but talk a little bit about somebody like me. I mean, here, I've been in this business a long time. Mm. I think there are things, I know there are things that I still don't get mm. about trans rights, about a trans vision of the world, mm. around trans expertise. Mm. Um, even as we cover alternatives and, and, you know, the tag of our show is the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. What does somebody even like me need to perhaps see that I'm not seeing about the importance of looking at the trans struggle and trans rights? I think trans is essential in a lot of different ways. Um, I was actually speaking uh, to uh, uh, someone who's been in, in women's movement and feminist movement recently about this long conversation. And there cannot be an into patriarchy without an embracing of trans rights. It's fundamentally impossible. And to the degree that we believe that patriarchy is a fundamental pillar on which injustice is built in our society, that means that that pillar can't be undone. Because as long as we have gender essentialism, as long as we think in binary ways, uh, we're gonna get caught in the same constant trap. And it's one of the reasons why we haven't made as much progress as we think we should have made on feminism and on women's rights. That's because misogyny and patriarchy are essentially still there and they work in the same ways. Um, around these issues. And so what trans, what the trans perspective does is that it under, fundamentally undermines that. It takes the core argument of biological determinism out 
of the conversation of gender, which then undermines patriarchy. So if if me being born this way doesn't mean that I automatically have this status in society, that means that those two things are totally separate, which then drives a completely different conversation. And so what trans about what trans is about is about the ability to see and to reimagine our society in broad ways that can lead towards justice and humanity and put human beings at the center of our systems rather than orthodoxy. Yeah, I mean, I wonder where we took a weird turn. Mm. Um, in the sense that when I was coming up, which you would say I sort of probably got my feminism in the 70s and mm. early 80s, mm. I was a queer left socialist feminist. Mm. And I thought that was sort of our vision was to destabilize the binaries and to um, undermine capitalist transactional relationships and right. instead have transformational, you know, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And then somehow it all became defending this law, defending this gain, and let's not talk about anything else while we're under attack. <laughs> right, I mean, I think that um, one of the things that is essential for us to understand is that even if we don't like the system, we've been raised in the system, <laughs> right? Um, a huge part of the system is didactic thinking. So even one thing against the, it's either, it's either or. So for instance, if you are a socialist feminist and you're in a meeting with men and women who are also socialist, um, and then there's a conversation about, well, we need to fight for worker cooperatives. Right. Um, and then someone raises their hand and says, well, what about the role of women in cooperatives? Because unless we have women leaders, and then they go, well, we can't do that because we can only do one right. thing at a time. Everyone's been raised in this binary system, right? Of thinking and of forcing you to make choice. And also the other thing that people don't think about is the way in which subconsciously everyone has absorbed um, all of the isms. Yeah. So um, one of the things, for instance, that patriarchy does really well is that it gets women to question ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, right? Just automatically, you automatically, when you, even when you think you know the right answer, you think about it twice, you know, and that's, and men don't do that, no, right? Like I've noticed. <laughs> right? There's never that consideration. So if then what happens, if someone in this proverbial meeting raises a doubt, then you begin to doubt yourself. Right. And it's a way in which you then are feeding into patriarchy in a way that you don't even think. Yeah. So it's fascinating and super exciting, and I wish we had more time, because it also seems like at a moment where technology is also mm. driving us towards a binary, kind of, are you a one or a zero? Is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Are you a friend or a not friend? What is your relationship? Um, the trans movement is saying, no, 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 no. Mutability is all, and in fact, trans is something we all need to embrace in terms of a sense of Absolutely. possibility. Absolutely. And, and, and well, yeah, mutability in a very rigid age. Exactly. One, one thing on that though, the one of the key areas of competition between the United States and China with respect to computing and technology is actually um, quantum computing, which takes you out of zeros and ones. So we may actually be moving to a world within our lifetimes where the binary, even within that, loses its power, which leads to entirely different possibilities, frightening possibilities for computing. But it means that we are living in a world in so many ways in which we're trying to impose a binary on a planet and a place that's resisting it. Yeah. Quantum engineering. I want to know more about it. Yeah, I hope I, I found out more on your show. All right, so final questions to people, or final comments to people mm. um, who want to join you and find you in the media, but also participate in this conversation more. What can they do? Where can they go? Um, the good thing about technology is social media. Um, so almost everything is Amara Jones. So if you type in my name on any social media platform, it's a very easy way to follow me. And then for The Last Sip, if you just go to Google and type in The Last Sip, it comes right up. All right, congratulations. Amara. Thank you so much for Great having me, I really appreciate it. See you soon. See you soon. Mara Jones, everybody. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. <laughs>
how my mom used all the stuff that was there. One of the crazy things is how fast, when I started wearing makeup, how fast I actually picked it up. And I think it's because even though I wasn't actually putting on anything, um, I was actually subconsciously taking everything in that was there. I think that in so many ways, it's like a metaphor for, um, for being trans is that all the time you're growing up in this different experience, in this totally different body than, uh, than how you feel inside and how we know through like science and stuff. But at the same time, you're totally absorbing everything subconsciously, which is interesting how gender works. It's not only about the body that you're grown into. It's like, it's also about all of the things that are subconsciously and unspokenly happening. My mom would have never worn this. <laughs> she would have never worn this color. It would not have been her color. I think that's good. I gotta clean up the edge with a Q-tip. But I think we're ready to go. Ready to face this first, not first, but like this very different pride for me. I'm Amara Jones. I am the creator of The Last Sip, and I am transitioning. Actually, I actually always know who I was. The problem never has been in knowing. The problem always has been in accepting it. Um, and I think a lot of people have that as an issue. It doesn't even have to be trans. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why I think that there is a huge backlash against trans people, because I think that there are a lot of people in this world who don't accept a lot of things about themselves and work to fight it and to see other people who don't resist um, who they really are, what they really want out of life, or who they really want to love or where they want to live um, enrages them. The thing about trans people, about us, is that the modern LGBTQ movement was started by trans women. So Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were the first to riot at Stonewall. Every way that you can think of all of the process and progress that we've had on LGBTQ rights, whether or not it be social, political, now medical, trans people have been essential to that and essential to that story. Hey, Dre, <laughs> come in with your awkward self. We want to be able to control our bodies. Yeah. Put your stuff down. It's not getting breast augmentation. Exactly. It's getting breasts. Exactly. Because you ain't having to begin with. Right. So it's different to have little boobs when you're getting bigger boobs. Right, exactly. You're just getting boobs, period. Exactly. Jay-Z all intimate. And Okay, he has three kids. You that. think he ain't having sex? You think he ain't rubbing something down? You might not. Maybe it's because you don't look at him and think sex. And so when you see him in a that's bed, that's so true. That's it's why. So true. That's why it's uncomfortable. For it's you. so true. It has nothing to do with Beyonce and whatever. It's just it's you true. don't see sex or you don't think of sex when you look at him. There is an increasingly aggressive, hostile, dark movement that is at work in the States to penalize people that help us, to ban various rights that we have, to target and other us, which sets us up for violence. I'm lucky enough to know people like you and to be able to sit down and actually answer the questions that I have. Is this a really good time to transition? In 2017, um, we had the highest number of hate violence related homicides, the highest number of single incident hate violence homicides that we had ever counted in this country. People are, in our communities, are having a really hard time across the country. People are calling us over and over again. You might experience multiple incidents of violence um, just in the course of your everyday life. You might be traumatized by just the impact of the hate that we're seeing in the world that's playing out in terms of policies that are playing out in, you know, 
what we might call sort of the daily incidents of violence. I really wish we had never coined the term microaggressions because aggressions are aggressions and they have impact. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. It's an intense time to be trans. <laughs> there are trans people that are visible across the board. I really try to just like monitor my space before I like go anywhere and make sure I'm able to have an exit plan or have um, some kind of allyship with people that are around me, make sure I'm like, I, that's why I look at people like, okay, I know if someone's going down, that person would get up and kind of help me out. I think we're, we've never been so visible, so people are looking for us. Mm. Like that's something I notice is like, people are really looking to clock us and like really looking like, like who's trans or like if you stand out in some way, like scrutinizing you. Trans women of color in particular are most impacted in our community by violence, particularly homicide. And we've seen across the country a number of LGBT community centers and safe spaces also under attack in a way that I think we haven't really seen in recent history. This documentary isn't political. It talks about policy, but the policies are driven by politics. 